There's no question the most important single attraction in Salzburg is the castle up on the hill. It's called the Hohen Salzburg Fortress. And you do not want to miss a visit to this citadel, which is claimed to be the largest and best preserved medieval castle in all of Europe. It's very easy to get up the hill. You just pay for your ticket to the funicular, and that includes the admission to the castle and its museum. Let this convenient train do the climbing for you. The funicular goes every five or 10 minutes, depending on traffic, so it's very convenient. Definitely the way to get up to the castle, which sits up atop a 400 foot high cliff. The first viewpoint comes shortly after getting out of the funicular. You just walk along the path, follow the arrows, and you'll soon be at what's called the Coinberg Bastion. Well, behind me you get a classic view looking down into the old town of Salzburg. This is from the Hohen Salzburg Fortress, also called the Salzburg Castle. You ride up the funicular and then you tour through the castle grounds and there's various terraces where you get these panorama views. Your trip up this hill would be worthwhile even if it was just for the spectacular view looking down on the old town and out across the plains to the mountains in the distance. And that makes the rest of your visit into this medieval world of the castle a rewarding bonus. As you gaze out across the city, you can get your bearings and see where you've been already, check off the buildings and consider the rest of your explorations and what other parts of town you want to catch. And then later there's another viewpoint out the backside of the castle hilltop and that's at what's called the Wreck Watchtower. And there you'll get a splendid panorama of the Alps, looking at peaks that reach about 6,000 feet off in the distance. We'll spend some more time over there later after you visited the interior of the castle. The steep hilltop is such a natural place for a fort. It was first used, they believe, by the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago. This castle was begun back in the 11th century and it still retains this feeling of great antiquity of those ages. It was originally built as a refuge for the archbishops who sided with the Pope in various church battles against the princes of South Germany. These archbishops ruled Salzburg for a thousand years using the tremendous wealth that they mined from the salt deposits to build up the city down below when filled it with churches and palaces and mansions that were created by the best architects and builders of each era. Once you've left the first terrace viewpoint, you climb another flight of step and there will be more staircases coming up shortly when you enter the museum to get up to the upper levels, but it's all worth it. It's not that big a climb and the courtyard interior is mostly level. The first staircase will bring you into this barrel vaulted chamber with the cannons pointing out through the gun slits. That's a very impressive part of the castle and it shows you they were pointing their cannons at the village down below, not so much at foreign enemies who might be trying to attack. It was to keep the townspeople at bay. Now this, this fortress was never invaded. Nobody ever was able to attack and conquer the fortress. But if there was any attempts, then they would fire the signal cannons to rally the troops. This is quite the medieval hallway. Okay, first we'll see all the grounds and then we can go inside the museum. We'll do the outside first. Yeah, we'll do the outside first, exactly. You'll next step out into the big open courtyard, which must have been quite a busy place in the old days. Now, if you're here in the morning, you'll probably find it quite empty. Maybe a few other tourists looking around, but about the only thing here in the courtyard now is one tree, the old lime tree, and a small well, and that's about it. But this was a premium chunk of real estate. After all, surrounded by the castle, and this courtyard was really a luxurious space for back then in the Middle Ages to, to have on, on a plateau on the top of a mountain to have a nice level space like this. It's really remarkable. So this would have been a very comfortable home for the archbishops. 
More than most European towns, Salzburg was founded and nurtured by the Catholic Church, and it was ruled by bishops rather than kings or a secular nobility, so it figures they would have a spectacular castle for self-defense. A thousand years of bishops. This chapel is a very, um, a very old part of the castle grounds, and it's in the Gothic style. We we'll go inside, it's um, quite small. It has some beautiful statues around the walls. This rib vaulting was both functional as well as for decoration, like uh, an I-beam or rebar to hold that stone ceiling up. This chapel of St. George dates back to 1501. We continue through the courtyard. Back in the old days, this was the workshop, it was a people place, it was the plaza where everybody would gather and spend time. This castle is so big that it feels like you're walking through a medieval village, not just a building with walls around it. It seems like one of those spectacular old towns that was fortified with turrets and walls and courtyards and moats beyond. More like a city than a castle, and indeed, that's how it functioned back then. There was 100 people who lived up here on the hilltop, and they had a source of water, they had their granary, they had all their food stored up here. It's likely that many of the residents would not exit the sanctuary for long periods of time to stay up here in the comfort and security of the hilltop fortress. Naturally, over the centuries, this castle was frequently enlarged and remodeled, becoming a comfortable it's residence a... for the bishops and their court. Construction was finally finished by the end of the 17th century with the addition of towers and state rooms, along with bastions for cannons and barbicons and the construction of magazines and arms depots. Altogether, the complex that we see today took about 600 years to build. A computer graphic on display inside the castle gives you a vivid idea of the growth and final shape of this fortress. One of the various interesting perspectives here is Whoa. the view along the inner castle moat, which never really held water and looks like an ancient cobble lane with crenellated towers rising above the solid stone walls. This dry moat leads to a salt depot where the precious cargo that they called white gold was stored. The word Salzburg means salt castle, showing the importance of that compound, always the number one product of the area. Your ticket includes admission inside the castle to the museum. There's no elevator. You do have to climb a couple flights of steps to get inside where you'll see exhibits about the various archbishops and the history of the region. And there's also plans and three-dimensional models showing the growth of the castle and of the town below. And there's a military museum with suits of armor and ancient weapons and some uniforms from World War I even. Inside, you'll also see the intricate Gothic wood carvings and ornamental paintings that decorate the Golden Hall and the Golden Chamber. Many evenings there are chamber music concerts here that take advantage of the excellent acoustics and small size of the princess room. Uh, one of the more interesting benefits of walking around inside the museum is just appreciating the building itself. Never mind the cases for a moment, just look at the walls, the ceiling, the columns. They've done a marvelous job of restoration and also they have revealed for you some of the interiors of the walls so that you can peel back the layers of time and see how the walls looked at an earlier time of history, maybe 400, 500 years ago. You can even see what appears to be some original wall paintings on these ancient bricks inside a plaster wall that's been peeled off to reveal the contents. You go from one room to another with various display cases in this room, we have a variety of old torture instruments, some kind of a metal face mask they would put on to punish a gossip. There's racks and there's ways to make the body feel some pain here. They didn't believe so much in prisons back then. Instead, they would just torture people for a while. 
or lock them up in stocks and put them on public display for ridicule. A variety of old musical instruments reminds us that they undoubtedly enjoyed some concerts up here inside the castle 400, 500 years ago, just as they still enjoy today. Another case is filled with various guns. This must have been from the early 1500s, the early days of gunpowder and Western armaments. You've got handheld pistols and some smaller blunderbuss rifles. This is um, ancient weaponry, reminding us, after all, that we are inside a fortified castle. One of the most dramatic displays looks like an army charging at you, soldiers with helmets and armor and swords backed up by cannons and artillery. This is perhaps an example of why this castle was never taken by any enemy invasion. They were well equipped and well armed. They had their own private army here to defend themselves. There was one time the castle did come under siege. It was way back in 1525 in what was called the German Peasants' War. It was a major uprising in Central Europe, it affected Germany, parts of Switzerland and Austria, and they were defeated. The peasants were pushed back. It was a one-year uprising, and perhaps some of those peasants came up against this armored force. The display cases make it very clear that you are walking around inside a fortress. It was not just a palace for the bishops, but it was an armed castle to repel the invaders. With the dramatic vertical cliffs all around it and the massive fortified walls lined with cannons, this castle up on the vertical plateau was impregnable. And with its large food warehouse and water well, the occupants could withstand any siege. And so the castle was never conquered. The purpose of the fortress was not only to prevent attack by foreign aggressors, but also to control the townspeople down below in that old familiar scenario. The rich rulers up on the hill, lording it over the peasants down below. However, the bishops who governed from here were often at each other's throats with internal intrigue, bringing down more than one. Even Archbishop Wolf Dietrich, who initiated the lower town's three grandest buildings, the cathedral, the residence, and Mirabel Palace, was deposed and imprisoned in the castle for his final five years over a dispute with his nephew about salt mining money. It's pretty obvious when you reach the private rooms of the archbishop, beautifully decorated, but the main residence of the archbishops was always in the town in the beautiful palace called the residence. There's a large ceramic heater in one end of the room and that kept the temperature nice and comfortable for the archbishop. They would keep the charcoal embers glowing nicely inside this big heater. And with the large porcelain surface, it radiated out in a very efficient way to keep the whole room warm, even in the coldest snowy winter day. In this one complex, you have all the variety of buildings and features that a village could need, including a toilet. There's the kitchens, there's the storehouses, the residences, the open courtyard, the workshops, and the great hall for the noble bishop who was running the show. And of course, as you're exiting the castle museum, naturally there's a gift shop that you have to walk through. And they really have a big variety of items here in this large shop. You can get anything from an umbrella to postcards, they've got toy spears and swords, of course a lot of books, there's CDs and DVDs, little puppets and wooden toys, a great variety of things to consider. It's really high quality stuff in the shop and you get the feeling if you're spending money here you're helping to support the castle and its maintenance so by all means take a look. When you're all done with your visit inside the castle museum then you go back out the way you came in, back down the staircase. Again, there's no elevator, but it's easy walking, especially when you're going down. Down, 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 a couple of flights. 
getting that castle medieval experience as you go. And then there's one final feature to enjoy at the castle, and that's the other view out the back side of the castle, where you're looking not down on the town, but across the fields and off to the distant mountains. When you're visiting the castle, you want to be sure to come out on the back terrace for this spectacular view looking into the Austrian Alps. Some days the clouds are really dramatic, other days it's just a bright sunny day. Any kind of weather conditions, you want to be sure to come have a look and take some photos on this back terrace. And then there's a cafe just down below. You could drop anchor and have a snack, have a coffee, have a beer. It's really one of the great views of the Salzburg area. And you only get it when you're up inside the castle. And the clouds make it so wonderful too. Yeah. You'd think, oh, a cloudy day, but these are so dramatic, these clouds today. Some clouds are lit up. Yeah, yeah, it's like a light show. Of course, you can always get a meal in the restaurant that's up here, and you can see it's really quite a high quality restaurant. Looks like a beautiful place to eat. You don't get the greatest view from inside the restaurant, but there are windows, and if you have a table by the window, you can enjoy the scene while you dine. The castle visit takes anywhere from one to three hours, depending on your level of interest and whether you went inside the museums and really dwelled over the exhibits or just buzzed through. At any rate, when you're finished, the town is just a two-minute ride back down the same funicular using the same ticket that brought you up.